everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Caitlin, and today I have a case that has stumped even the best investigators and FBI agents. It is the unsolved murder of Ricky McCormick. So Ricky C. McCormick was born on June 14th, 1958. There isn't too much information on where he was originally born, but this whole thing took place in Missouri, which it seems is where he lived most of his life. And not too much information is really known about his childhood. But what we do know is he didn't have the easiest life growing up and it's said that his family always knew he was different and he was thought to have some kind of mental disability or illness. So Ricky always seemed to stand out and be a little bit different than everybody else. He was known to display unusual behavior and to make up tall tales. His mom, her name is Frankie, she described him as the R word. His own mom described him as that. His cousin Charles, who was like a brother to him most of his life, said that that Ricky would often talk like he was in another world. As a child, he would spend so much time alone at recess that his school administrators would call his mom and ask if anything was wrong. So Ricky's aunt, her name is Gloria, said that when Ricky was younger, he went to see a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said that Ricky had a brick wall up in his mind and he refused to break it. He also said that Ricky didn't like living poor and he had a very active imagination. Ricky and his aunt seemed to be very close and and he often confined in her. Um, she said that her home always seemed like a type of sanctuary for him. And even into his adult life, Ricky and her had a very close relationship, even closer than his own mother. School wasn't Ricky's strong suit, as you could maybe imagine with his learning disability. It was reported that he could barely read or write. And by the time he made it to high school, he dropped out. His family suspected that he suffered from maybe schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but he was never tested or treated for it officially. So after dropping out of high school, Ricky worked entry-level jobs like a floor mopper, dishwasher, a busboy, even a service station attendant. He preferred to work the night shift and was given the reputation as a night owl. His aunt even called him a vampire because he slept all day and would rise at night. He would get disability checks as well because he had chronic heart problems. So as a teenager and into his young adult life, Ricky tried to stay away from gun violence in the street life and he would even go as far as to hitch rides and ride the bus so he didn't have to interact with the drug dealers who were usually posted around his neighborhood because he didn't live in the best neighborhood. Trouble did seem to find him though eventually. So in November of 1992, St. Louis police arrested him on statutory for having fathered two children with a young girl who was less than 14 years old. He was 34 at the time. It was reported in court files that he had been having sexual relations with her since she was 11. 11. Her identity is protected, but Ricky's mom and aunt said that he called her by the nickname Pretty Baby, which is very eerie considering how young she was. And while he was on trial, the public defender said that he had reasonable cause to believe that Ricky was suffering from a mental disease or defect and the judge did order a mental exam. The psychiatrist who was assigned was named Dr. Michael Armour and he evaluated Ricky at what was known as the former St. Louis State Hospital. Now his report wasn't officially released to the public but Ricky was found deemed fit to do his trial and Ricky did end up pleading guilty for the crime and he would only spend 13 months behind bars. Ricky's next and final job once he was out was reportedly working as a gas station attendant at a local Amoco gas station in St. Louis. The gas station he worked at had a very violent past. The previous owner of the gas station, Fawaz Hamda, he killed his neighbor with a butcher knife in his front yard during an argument. And the new owner, who was also Ricky's boss at the time, his name was Baha, also had a violent streak. Shortly after Baha originally moved to St. Louis in 1997, police witnessed him do a drive-by shooting of a man. The man did escape unharmed, and Baha was never prosecuted for the crime. Nine months later though, Baha was visiting his older brother and got into an argument and open fired on him across the street. His brother was wounded in the abdomen, but nothing is said if he pressed charges against Baha, which I'm assuming he didn't. And later that same month though, Baha was arrested on a felony charge for a second degree assault. He allegedly beat a homeless man with a rusty hammer and threatened to kill him unless he got off the gas station property. Now Baha told the police that I just figured I'd take care of this myself. 
itself. Two weeks before the case was supposed to go to court, the victim was mysteriously gunned down and killed just blocks away from the gas station. The assault charges died that night with the victim, and his murder still remains unsolved today. A confidential informant, though, did tell the police that the victim was killed at the hands of Baja. There are also years of police reports and witness statements stating that Baja had violent episodes. So it was alleged that Baja would frequently have Ricky partake in illegal side hustles for money and it is known that Ricky would often travel to Orlando, Florida and and allegedly pick up large amounts of marijuana for Baja. His most recent trip was in June of 1999. His girlfriend at the time, her name was Sandra, and his aunt both said that after Ricky's latest trip to Orlando, he seemed to act scared. He never liked to talk about his trips to Orlando, but after this specific one, he just seemed off and a little bit different. So Ricky visited the Forest Park Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri on June 20th, 1999. He claimed he needed a checkup and was having chest pains. He was a well-known frequent visitor of this hospital because of his chronic heart and lung problems, and he also suffered from asthma and chest pains since he was a child. Doctors ruled out a heart attack and admitted him for two days for observation. It is believed that he might have gone to this hospital just for a safe place to stay. After leaving the hospital, um, he took a bus to his aunt's apartment and he visited with her for about an hour. He frequently would go and talk to her and she seemed to be like the only person he could talk to, but on this particular visit, he didn't really reveal much. On June 25th, he went to the emergency room at the same hospital he had just been at recently, only days before, and this time it was for chest pains and trouble breathing. He was diagnosed with an asthma flare-up and wasn't admitted. He officially was released around around 5 50 p.m. but it's not clear if he actually left the hospital. His aunt says that she heard Ricky spent the night in the waiting room before leaving the next morning. This further puts suspicion on him using the hospital as a safe place to hide out. His aunt even stated that looking back now she suspects his hospital visits were an attempt to find a hideout where he could lay low. She said that maybe he knew he got into something that put his life on the line. She said that he always knew that he could stay at her place but maybe he didn't want to put her life in trouble for what he had possibly done. Now his girlfriend said that she talked to him on the phone the next morning after coming from the hospital at 11 30 a.m. He told her he was out of the hospital and going to the Amical gas station to grab a bite to eat. So on the morning of June 27th 1999 which is that same morning one of his gas station co-workers reported seeing Ricky stop by the gas station briefly. This employee was the last recorded person to see Ricky alive. On June 30th, 1999, a woman was driving through a rural area near West Alton, Missouri and noticed something strange just off the side of a quiet road near Route 367. It was the body of Ricky. He was only 41 at the time. When investigators found him, his body was badly decomposed and he was laying face down in a cornfield. His body was so bad that the flesh on his hands was already rotting to the point that his fingertips had fallen off and were lying next to him in the weeds. Police were able to identify him though through his fingerprints because they were still intact. Police did find it very strange though that his body was so badly decomposed because they estimated he couldn't have died more than three days prior and also the weather at the time was very moderate and that you couldn't really blame that on why he was so badly decomposed. Police did believe maybe he was killed elsewhere and kept in a hot building or vehicle before being dumped in the cornfield and police were puzzled how his corpse even ended up in a cornfield in rural St. Charles County which is 20 miles from where Ricky worked and lived. He lived in downtown St. Louis. He didn't know anyone who lived in St. Louis County and he also didn't have a car and there wasn't any public transportation that went to the area. Since the body was so badly decomposed it made the autopsy difficult and the medical examiner's office ruled his death as undetermined but police did suspect foul play. So this small amount of land where his body was found it did lie between the Mississippi and Missouri River and had been a criminal dumping ground for years. So previously in 1995, a bullet-ridden body of an alleged prostitute was found in an abandoned house along this same stretch. And two years after Ricky's death, um, state road crews were mowing the grass just 300 yards from where his body was found and two bodies of nude women were found. Now when detectives searched Ricky's pockets to look for belongings on his body, they did find two pages of 
handwritten encrypted coded notes and the notes were kept a secret and not made known to the public for 12 years. In March of 2011, um, FBI official Dan Olson, who is the chief of the Bureau's Cryptanalysis and Racketeering Records Unit, or CRRU, in Quantico, Virginia, disclosed to the public for the very first time the existence of the notes. The FBI this whole time had been unable to decipher the notes and did release them to the public in hopes that someone out there would be able to help. The notes had stumped the world's best code breakers. Now, the notes actually rank third on the CRRU's list of top unsolved cases. The Zodiac Killer's letters are ranked just above these. It said the FBI codebreakers typically unlock the mean of ciphers they receive in a matter of hours, but the notes found on Ricky have been puzzling Dan Olson and the unit for over a decade. This is the same unit that broke the codes of the Nazi spies during World War II. Dan Olson also stated that when the notes first arrived, he looked them over, consulted experts, but they still remain unsolved. Now the FBI examines hundreds of codes each year and only about 1% go unbroken. Dan Olson stated in an interview Interview, it doesn't happen often that we have unsolved ciphers of this length and significance. The characters are not random. There are many E's, for example, that could be used as spacers. There are many heuristics that suggest it could be solved, many patterns, but the problem is we don't know why it is not solvable. According to the CRRU, there are four steps to cracking codes. The first would to be determine the language used. Second would be the system the code uses. Third would be to reconstruct the key of the code. And fourth would be applying the key and then basically transcribing the text. Now, Dan Olson did say that they can't even get past step two for Ricky's coded notes. Many people suggest that the notes are meaningless and just random scribbles and bringing up the fact that he was almost illiterate, but Dan Olson believes otherwise. He's convinced the codes could contain leads to who Ricky was with or where he was with before his death. He also believes Ricky wrote the notes himself. Ricky's family isn't so sure that he has ever written anything in code and they said that he could barely write his own name. They did say though that he often writes similar to the notes, but they just thought he was scribbling and didn't think too much of it. Now, there are four main theories of the notes. The first one is that Ricky's killer wrote the codes and left them on his body to throw off the investigation, but this seems pretty unlikely given the complexity of the notes and how long it would have taken to invent the code. And the second theory is that the notes are meaningless and between Ricky being only semi-literate and his mental illness, he didn't know what he was writing down. Cypher experts say, though, that the code isn't random and may believe that it's actually pretty sophisticated. Sophisticated. The third theory is that Ricky was working as a courier and was delivering encrypted messages to and from criminals. But why would the killer have left the note behind if it was an important message that shouldn't get into police hands? The fourth and final theory, and is the most popular theory, is that Ricky developed some sort of his own form of writing and language that only he could understand. Dan Olson said that the notes appear to be more like personal notes to oneself rather than something written for someone else. If this is true though, we may never know know what the notes say because his writing would have been affected by his learning disability and mental health. We would have to learn the language he invented to solve the codes first. Sadly, there aren't any existing samples of his handwriting either to prove that he is the one who wrote this. Now, his family wasn't even made aware of the notes until 12 years later, and they actually found out about the notes when they saw it on a local news broadcast. And at the time of his death, police told the family the only thing in his pockets was the emergency room ticket. Now, for the suspects in this case, the police did take a closer look at a man who was named Gregory Knox. He was a well-known drug dealer in Ricky's neighborhood, and he ha was already suspected for four other homicides in the area, including at least two murder-for-hire schemes, and police believed he may have been responsible for Ricky's death. A police informant allegedly overheard Gregory saying that he murdered a local gas station attendant, but police couldn't find enough evidence to tie him to the murder. The next suspect is Ricky's boss, Baja. When Ricky was in Orlando last before his death, there are actually phone records that show he did make several calls and at least one call to the Amico gas station he worked at, who Baja was the boss at. And his girlfriend also reported to the police after his death that Ricky would accept offers to pick up and deliver packages of marijuana for money and had made trips to Florida before on several occasions for Baja. So she was confirming this to be true. She said that Ricky told her that he was holding the packages of marijuana for Baja and that she thinks that on his last trip to Orlando, 
no, he might have done something wrong that made Baja mad. She did tell police that if anyone was going to hurt Ricky, it would probably be Baja. Yet again though, police couldn't find enough evidence to tie him to the murder. There are many mysteries about this case that are still unsolved today. Like how did his body end up so far from home? How did he end up there? How was he killed? And most importantly, where did these mysterious notes come from? Today, Ricky's final resting place is in Laurel Hill Memorial Gardens. There is no headstone marking his grave. And from what I've read, there was no sign that anyone has ever visited his plot. The FBI and police are still no closer today in figuring out the mystery of his death or the notes. Despite releasing the notes to the public, they are still unsolved and they have not received a reliable lead yet that would help them solve this case. Now, if you do have any information, if you do have any information or any knowledge of Ricky's murder, you can contact the St. Charles County Police Department at 636-942-3002 and I will have that linked below. This is all the information I have for you guys today on this case and I hope that you join me in my next video. Thank you so much for watching. Please stay safe and always be aware of your surroundings. Bye.